So, we have uh, last time covered the tubular members in full. I think we were looking at axial shear bending and uh, combined action. I think we spent sufficient time to understand how the design works. So, what we are going to now look at is the design of non tubular or open sections, which I think uh, is as important as tubular members because the substructure. Uh, we normally use tubular members as I mentioned several advantages when you are trying to use uh, tubular sections for jacket. Whereas, when you come to top sides we see exactly opposite you know tubular members do offer several good properties when it comes to submerged uh, hydrodynamic loading buoyancy uh, and, and so on. Whereas, for top side structures above water predominantly subjected to bending loads you know you might very well know that the floor is composed of floor beams and floor slab like concrete structure. Now, in this case you have floor slab is replaced by the uh, steel plate you know most of the offshore platforms plus you will have floor beams. Now, if you look at the loading on the top sides predominantly gravity loading which is going to be producing simple beam bending and to some extent you might have some wind loading you know horizontal loads, but that will be considerably low compared to what you normally have as a bending loads in substructures you know if you look at the percentage of wave loading versus the vertical loading the wave loading is substantially larger. So, you could see exactly opposite. So, we need to change our mindset how we optimize the structure. So, that is why this so called non tubular sections of course, it is not the first time we are using in offshore you know if you look at onshore building structures you use uh, this kind of uh, open sections heavily in industrial buildings. Of course, residential buildings we normally use concrete structures and uh, not very much useful because we cannot replicate. Whereas, the industrial structures mostly use open sections. So, that is what we are going to see the use of non tubular members why we change why not we use tubulars we will justify of course, there are several advantages and then we move on to some design aspects. Since you already have clear idea of tubular member design I think going through this is very easy because it is the same thing only section is replaced and section characteristics going to be changing and the behavior and allowable stress is going to change. Otherwise the procedure what we were looking at unity check allowable bending stress allowable axial stress allowable shear stress combining them unity check ratio all those procedures are almost same except section size and their uh, allowable characteristics are going to slightly change and then we look at also the connections. Since, we already had a very detailed discussion on tubular connections and their static behavior and their cyclic behavior dynamic loading. We also have to have quick look at, but it is not going to be so complicated here because the connections are quite simple and uh, design also quite simple because the way they get connected is easy to uh, you know basically look at the mechanics of the load transfer. Whereas, comparing the tubular connections we spend a lot of time trying to understand and then come up with a design procedure which is so complicated that you got to use only empirical procedure. Whereas, here I think mostly you will use a basic mechanics of load transfer by shear bending and, and things like that. So, in that sense it is quite simple in design of connections design of members also quite simple because you already have a clear idea. So, we will just spend next 3 classes on this particular topic the various areas of discussion is going to be something like this we will just introduce the, the sections and the special properties which makes them better use or which makes them actually more troublesome. So, we will look at that uh, torsional buckling and then the section properties major axis bending minor axis bending and then we will also look at the combined actions of uh, you know basically the axial and bending and then we look at how they behave in terms of symmetric section versus unsymmetric sections. We have you know both both forms whereas, in tubular sections you do not have much you do not use normally ellipse you use only circular section. So, that that here we have got various forms of uh, manipulation possible. So, symmetric and symmetric sections we will uh, use that and then we will also look at the connections as I mentioned beam beam connection beam column connections and basically beam and pipe connections some several times we use it you know if you look at a structure in a uh, offshore construction we will have columns as pipes and then beams as open sections. So, you will see that there is a combination of them coming in. So, that will uh, give us some idea so that you can understand. So, you can see on the right hand side you see a photograph which is a large top side comprised of several horizontal levels. So, you can see here 
if you do not get the clear picture, the first level what you see one line is actually a one floor like a building floor and you got one, two, three, I think three major floors and then on the sides you have several uh, secondary floors going above. So, you see this is the second floor, third floor and then you got several uh, uh, floors on the living side as well as on the other side. So, you can see it is just a horizontal uh, uh, floor made up steel pancake connected by columns and ultimately supporting facilities which will uh, produce oil and gas supported on the substructure which is at 4 or 8 points. In this particular case we got 8 columns which is jacket legs. So, it is very similar to any building construction you got columns you got beams only difference is it is going to be made of steel instead of concrete. So, the top side structures basically an offshore platform is to support equipments and facilities it is very similar to any building or industrial structures means predominantly gravity type of loading. So, means you need to support the floor, the floor beams and the floor plate or floor slab. In this case the floor beams are normally made of open sections because we know very well predominant loading is pure simple bending and that means we need to have sufficient in plane bending section or the property called moment of inertia or section modulus. So, that is what we are planning to have it. So, if you look at the right side you see here uh, you take a tubular section and compare the moment of inertia about the bending axis x x. You can optimize because you can see here the moment of inertia is going to be highly proportional to the flange area and the distance away from the neutral axis. If you do a simple moment of inertia calculation the more that you go away from the neutral axis your in plane moment of inertia is going to be higher because the area times square of the distance. So, that is where we try to play around if you look at this tubular lot of area is wasted at the middle because it is not serving any purpose for us by keeping the flanges away. So, for the same circular section if you just rearrange the, the wall thickness you can get more moment of inertia of course, the vice versa to get the same moment of inertia as the pipe you can reduce the weight considerably. So, you just need to do a quick calculations to see whether that is true or not. So, that is one of the advantages the other advantage in case of vertical loading for example, gravity loading you seem to have large shear is not it because you have too much of weight. So, you want to manipulate the shear in vertical direction if you look at the pipe the shear in any direction is same shear capacity whereas, if you look at the the, the beam the shear capacity in vertical direction is predominantly large because we arrange a web which is going to take large amount of vertical shear. So, you try to achieve what we wanted. So, that is why you from a circular section you manipulate the section into getting maximum moment of inertia maximum shear capacity. So, that is why because it the loading is like that and it is gravity loading is very well known because you know what facilities you are going to put the uncertainty is very very small it is not that tomorrow the uh, weight of the equipment is going to act horizontally is not it whereas, the wave loading you know the uncertainty associated with it the wave direction the wave heights and the kind of wave load it will produce you you are not very sure that is why uniform cross section is essential in the substructure rather than uh, open sections. So, that is why you can see a great advantage of manipulating the circular section into a open section which can offer a higher resistance or we can reduce the weight for the same work to be done. So, that is the idea behind why we use substantially all the floor beams, but of course, when it comes to columns we still see a big problem with the open sections you see the column one direction the bending is very good the other direction is very weak. So, that is why we take columns most of the columns in uh, offshore platforms we make use of pipe sections and all the floor beams we make use of this kind of open sections. I just made a simple comparison just to show you that most of the sections if you manipulate you will see that the I sections are efficient than the pipe sections for a given uh, you know depth of the beam. For example, I just utilize the depth of the beam and the depth of the, the tubular section or the diameter of the tubular section I made it same and you can see comparison of weight and weight of I section as well as moment of inertia and moment of inertia both of them is in advantageous position weight is lower moment of inertia is higher. Of course, what I did to 
make a comparison properly, I made the d by t ratio of the pipe section to be equal to 30. I think you might remember when you look at the bending stress variation, I think you can recollect your memory. The bending stress is maximum 0.66 Fy up to a d by t ratio of 30. After that only starts to reduce. Same thing I have done here for the, the open sections, we are going to learn that as long as you keep the sections compact, the bending stress, the allowable bending stress will be maximum. So, I am just going to compare both in a similar platform because if you do not do that, then the comparison becomes no, no use because you may actually manipulate the section can be made weaker, but then the allowable stress can be substantially smaller. So, that is why both the cases I am keeping the allowable stress same that means 0 0.66 Fy and try to just see the advantage of the depth and manipulated weight, manipulated moment of inertia always going to be higher as you can see from the previous picture what you see here. You are just rearranging the same material in a right place for right job that is the idea behind. So, that is why you will see that pipe sections we should not call here as a deficient section for this purpose it is not very useful. So, that is why we are changing to I sections. Typically, if you see this uh, drawing, this is how uh, offshore platform floor will look like. You know, you this is particularly a four column structure, four column is basically one column here, another column, another column, another column and then uh, the, I do not know whether you can see the colors. The blue color is the grid beams where it should be deeper and you see other uh, yellow color beams which are floor beams or uh, runner beams, you know basically supporting the equipments floor plate and facilities. So, you can see here these this this circular columns carry all the loads from elsewhere all around carry all the way down to the substructure which is supported on the ground by pile foundation. So, basically this columns are very important to carry all the loads collect all the loads each floor from floor 1, floor 2, floor 3 and then make them to go down to the jacket structure. Typically a elevation of a particular grid, you know you got grid 1, grid 2, grid 3. So, I just took one grid to show you how it looks like. So, you can see here this is one of the floor which you see in that horizontal parallel lines and another floor here and connected by two columns and some uh, inclined braces for stability purpose, so that it does not sway. We will look at the sway and non-sway frames. I think you might have studied in your applied mechanics the difference between a sway frame and non-sway frame. You will see that buckling will be a problem. So, basic idea is this is how a typical superstructure of a offshore platform looks like. All those small, small uh, eye shapes drawn here shows that the floor beams are running in that the particular direction and uh, that is the idea. So, if you would like to know a little bit more how they are constructed, you can see here the four columns are here 2, 3 and 4 and uh, the green color is the main girders and the red color is the floor beams. I purposely did not put the floor plate because otherwise you can see. So, basic idea is this is how you construct a typical floor and you can duplicate it and then just stack up one by one. So, typical deck floor will consist of columns major floor beams and secondary floor beams or runner beams and uh, deck filling plate support members. So, we are going to see the design of these floor beams, how they are going to help us. So, some cases we will use I section, some cases we will use channels depending on the availability and their load category and angle bars or maybe box sections. You see the box section is almost similar to a circular section or a kind of if you if you find out equally. So, wherever there is a out of plane bending is predominant you go for box sections. What you are trying to do is just manipulate the circular section into you know the top and bottom flange and two side webs. Many times we do not prefer this because fabrication of this is very difficult, but I sections is readily available you can go and buy from the mill you do not need to fabricate. So, we will see the design of these one in the next two three classes, but of course the procedure is similar. Only thing is because of their asymmetry in uh, in vertical direction, the calculation becomes slightly uh, exhaustive. 
So, you, but the idea is very similar. Similarly, for angles, behavior is going to be slightly different than this kind of symmetric sections. So, what we will be looking at uh, is basically a, a different characteristic compared to circular section. That is what we are going to see. What I mentioned in uh, during the tubular design, the tubular section does not have a property called a torsional buckling because it is closed. So, it is not going to get torsion there. So, that is the predominantly one difference. The open section behavior is going to be different in the shear flow. So, that we are going to see and else remaining is almost same. So, the local buckling contains because it is open section you got flange you got web whereas, in the circular section it is a continuous section connected together. So, such separation is not there and in case of open section we also attach some stiffeners. So, stiffeners also may contribute to local strength and we need to see whether the stiffener is uh, sufficient uh, enough to support for the purpose for which you have actually placed the stiffener. It should not so become that if the stiffener is so weak instead of stiffener supporting the member the member supports the stiffener. So, you need to make sure that the stiffener is having sufficient thickness, sufficient rigidity and then we look at the elastic plastic properties which I think for tubular section we derived. Remember uh, we spent a lot of time in going back to the basics. So, we will just spend some time and then we look at the LTB which is the, the most important characteristics among the difference between open section and the, the circular section. And then we also look at uh, the manufacturing methods not in detail, but just to see how we can actually get the beams manufactured global buckling and the strength consideration and the last one is the stability method or how you actually going to establish the relationship between the stability and the design method. So, the stability requirements what exactly means you might uh, recollect a portal frame you know simple portal frame and apply a horizontal load apply a vertical load what happens is trying to sway with a large displacement in horizontal direction. But if you go and do a bracing pattern which may prevent the sway action. So, that is what we are going to see that is why many times when you design a whether it is onshore or offshore structure or uh, building structure you know you try to brace. So, that the unnecessary sway action comes into picture additional secondary moments will develop which is not going to be of any use. So, as long as you can try to brace it the sway action can be reduced. So, basic idea is the second order effects there are two things to be considered one is the P delta effect which is basically a sway and B delta effect which is the beam bending or local deformation of the beam which produces additional moment because when you do a linear elastic analysis you ignore this, but in reality if it is going to happen how you can incorporate because in olden days like 1960s and 70s people used to do a simple hand calculation for bending moment column forces try to design. As the finite element concepts came into picture everyone does the FE analysis of a frame, but only linear analysis, but when you are doing linear analysis you do not incorporate these two effects. So, we have always been thinking about incorporating in an indirect manner like the effective length method. We try to incorporate the column buckling by means of buckling coefficient which is comparing with the Euler buckling of any column with the different boundary conditions that is what we normally do it for a cantilever for a fixed beam we have a different effective length factor, but how accurate is it? It is not very accurate. So, that is why AAC the, the new AAC design I hope I have explained what is AAC you know the American Institute of Steel Construction which is a acceptable code for all the offshore structures for top sides. So, which I am going to discuss of course, you could use IS 800 I think some of you might have studied in your, uh, your uh, college days, but substantially the uh, offshore industry is using uh, AAC codes uh, basically for certification purposes. Many of the certification agencies do not recognize regional codes. So, they will always ask for a American codes. So, that is one of the reason why though you can use IS 800 which is a definitely a similar code and you already have some knowledge during your college days. So, I am just going to introduce this uh, AAC code which will be very useful for practice. And then we look at the geometric imperfections very similar to tubular sections. I think we were looking at uh, uh, out of shape which is 1 percent 2 percent of diameter or out of verticality you know 
5 mm, 6 mm we were talking about. So, how do we incorporate that in the design and basically the codes take care of that. Stiffness reduction due to inelasticity whether we want to go to elastic stage or inelastic and then the uncertainty in the stiffness and modeling for strength. So, these are some of the characteristics AAC code requires you to address when you are doing design. Earlier 9th edition code they do not talk about so many parameters you talk about elastic deformation and design it. So, the new code requires you to address this in some way of other. So, the basic methods of addressing is very simple the direct analysis method you choose a method which you can incorporate the second order effects that means you will do a analysis in stepwise procedure updated Lagrangian method. I think some of you might do a course on AP uh, analysis next time or uh, I can just quickly look at this picture to explain what is second order effects. If I have a column and carry only axial load there is no moment right and if it is if there is a column only carries horizontal load the moment is only due to the horizontal load, but if it carries both what happens is there is a coupling effect. The horizontal load produces a horizontal displacement of delta or x whatever, but because of the delta and the axial load acting on the column is shifted horizontally because of the column movement at the top produces additional moment which is basically the vertical load multiplied by the delta. So, this is called the uh, second order effects which is normally not covered in any of the linear elastic analysis softwares or by theory you might have studied in your uh, basic mechanics applied mechanics we normally ignore such kind of coupling effects. We superimpose the, the, the response of the structures without coupling effect which is what is called uh, the linear superposition that is why it is called a linear uh, analysis. When you do not take into account such interaction then it is slightly approximative, but the, the idea of that linear method is assuming that this delta is considerably small that is the assumption we make the displacement of the structure is so small that we can ignore, but whenever it is not so small according to your thinking or according to the codes justification that when the displacements are larger enough to produce secondary moments which can cause substantial stresses to the columns or beam then we cannot ignore. So, that is exactly the idea. So, this P delta B delta analysis some of the softwares can handle not all of them that means, you will divide the load into several uh, sub steps apply one load for example, you have 100 kilo Newton horizontal or 100 kilo Newton vertical you do not apply in one step you apply in sequence 100 divided by 10 steps apply 10 the column is displaced and you recalculate the stiffness and apply the vertical load also in step. So, you can see there is a interaction between. So, you keep on increasing that loads in steps that you are not going to take the original stiffness of the structure you are going to take the stiffness based on the deflected, stru deflected structure that is why they, that is called a, the reduced stiffness once the column is deflected. So, that also is supposed to be taken by analysis and that is what is not taken normally any analysis what we are doing is normally not taken and uh, even now we do not do this because this procedure is substantially time consuming and also not all software tools are capable of doing this. So, we do actually so called this is a rigorous second order analysis, but what we normally do is we do a simple linear analysis but somehow in alternate methods of taking into account these effects which is called one of the method is the effective length method or effective length factor method we try to incorporate the second order effects in terms of effective length factors. The third method you could also do do a first order analysis, but then instead of applying k factor you look at actually the results of the analysis and calculate the factors to account for the p delta and p delta. So, basically that is the third method which is also now recognized by uh, these, these AAC codes and that is what you would not find in IS 800. IS 800 is predominantly based on the effective length factor method which is reasonably simple I think and I think many of us uh, have been practicing this method nothing wrong, but of course when the structure is having large deformation 
the effective length, length method becomes reasonably not correct because the deformation is larger then you, you your effective length method is predicting under the capacity is under predicted. So, basically that is why we need to use this method. This was not there until the previous edition of the AAC code. Now, they have introduced this uh, as a special case and then we can use that. So, we will just look at quickly what is that effect. So, you can see from this picture there is a local deformation of the beam due to local member forces or applied loading on the member which you, if you see a simply supported beam is going to sag like this and if you look at the other horizontal loads applied either on the nodal points or on the beam or column will also produce a horizontal sway action. So, the, the total structural response is basically the, the P delta effect whereas, the P delta effect is basically based on local member effects which is going to cause additional moments and forces. The method of calculation is given by AAC is basically the, the M N T X and M L T X is the moments calculated from the first order analysis and the multiplier B 1 and B 2 are taking into account for P delta effect and B delta effect. The procedure is very simple you do a simple linear analysis compute the displacements of the nodal points as well as the member for member uh, intermediate points and calculate the beta 1 uh, B 1 and B 2 and multiply that with the original forces obtained from the, the analysis to get the design forces. I think some of you if you have studied uh, uh, RC design to IS 456, we do this exact exactly this. You know basically when you design a column, we also add additional moments due to minimum eccentricity. I think you might have learned about it. Though the column is vertical, not producing any moment because it is a column subjected to axial load, still we design for certain minimum moment basically because of several reasons. One of the reason is the second order effects, the other reason is the out of plumbness which is to be accounted during construction, otherwise the, the construction has to be 100 percent with 0 percent deviation. So, that is basically the idea. So, these additional moments is going to be taken and these factors beta 1 and beta 2 must be greater than must be greater than 1. If it is less than 1 it is no use because it is has to be amplified. The quick idea of beta 1 and beta 2 is to take into effect the interaction between the axial load and the axial buckling load. So, you can see here P is the load that is coming from the analysis, P elastic buckling load you can calculate using this Euler buckling formula, I think you are familiar with this and C m is the coefficient which we discussed during our uh, tubular member design for end moment factor you know. So, you can calculate for I beams the AAC is suggesting such a simple formula. If you look at the A API table also that formula is available is the interaction between two end moments. So, you can calculate the beta 1 factor applied to the original moments obtained from the, the first order analysis. Similarly, quickly I will show you the formula for proposed for B 2 which is taking into account the B delta effect. Here is base alpha is, is taken as 1.6 in, in this case also I forgot to mention is same factor of safety which we use for design 1.6 and uh, this P story and P E story is, is definition is individual, whichever the story you are looking at. For example, if I go back to this picture, so these are two story uh, portal frame, each story you will have the loads applied and correspondingly you can find out the total buckling force divided by the overall uh, buckling force. So, basically each floor wise you can calculate based on the, the delta what you have. So, this procedure to calculate V 2 is also elaborately given, I have just given the extract of the information here. What you need to inherit from here is trying to incorporate the second order effects by means of uh, multiplier coefficients taking into effect the global deformation as well as local deformation. The nitty gritty details of calculations you could always refer to the code because some of the information below I have not given here, but the idea behind is horizontal forces on each of the story compared to the total elastic buckling load. So, basically uh, will give you an idea of what kind of coefficients. These coefficients will not be very large, it should be somewhere around 1 to 2, it cannot be very large that means the structure is unusable. 
So, 1.1, 1.2 something similar order. The next item that we need to discuss quickly is the, the torsional buckling of I beams. You can see from this picture the load is applied to the center of the web. Sometimes we call it shear center. I think you might also have heard a term called a shear center. For open section, shear center is the intersection of the x and y axis, the principal axis. In this case, for I section, it will be center of the web. You know, so you can see here, even though the load is applied vertically downwards at the center of the web, you can see why the beam has rotated. You know, it's basically supposed to bend nicely like this, isn't it? And uh, that is exactly the idea of the torsional buckling. It's try to rotate number one, and very similar to a torsion. Though we have not applied any torsional load, it is going this way. Imagine if this column is made, uh, if this beam is made slightly smaller in length, this may not happen. So, that means it is related to section, it is related to the length. So, that is what we are going to see. You make the section larger, very big beam, instead of 1 200 mm, you make it 1 meter, this may not happen because the beam has got sufficient rigidity to avoid rotation. So, here it becomes too flimsy. But that is only a superficial, superficial explanation. Why this happens? This we need to really investigate. Imagine you take one short beam, apply the loading. Cantilever. Let us talk about a cantilever. You apply the loading like this. What happens to the top flange? It is going to get the compression uh, tension stresses. The bottom flange is going to get compressive stress. But when you go to the near the support, the compressive stress is going to be larger, basically because of the larger moment that is attracted there. So, the steel has got a characteristic in tension, it can elongate as much as possible and it can break, is not it? When you do a tensile testing, it can break until so large deformation is feasible. Whereas in compression, steel is a dense material. The crystalline structure does not allow the compaction of steel beyond certain strain value. So that is exactly the problem. So when you have a larger compressive stress at the the back end of the beam at this point, what happens? Unable to compress uh, axially, is trying to relieve by twisting, and that's the problem with this. So, basically whenever the large bending strains exist, this will happen. So, large bending strain is associated with smaller section, longer length. You, you got the idea, no? So, similarly the same thing will happen in a supported beam at both ends. The compression is at the top flange, tension is at the bottom flange, the beam will try to rotate. So, how we can prevent this rotation? If you can just go there and hold it, is not it? So, if you hold the compression flange from rotation, you can prevent it. So, that means it is not a dead end for us. You can have a smaller beam, you can have a longer length as long as you prevent the compression flange from rotation. So, you just hold it from the side. That means, if you build a perpendicular beam, the beam will not do this. So, that is the idea behind how do we prevent this. We will see some few pictures. So, that is what we are trying to do. From the side, if you are able to give a uh, uh, you know restraint to prevent the rotation, we can do this. So, you can see here the same thing is given in another three dimensional picture. So, you can see here on the left side, when the length of the beam is less than the critical length beyond which is going to rotate, which is basically the torsional buckling, the beam is bending in a nice simpler way. Whereas, on the right side, the length is same, maybe the section is smaller or the section is same, the length is bigger. So, either way it can happen. So, you can see here the beam is trying to rotate rotate along the, the uh, you know axis of the member. So, how we can prevent by providing uh, compression flange restraint. So, you can see here in this case I just provided a same depth beam, but not necessary. What you need is actually the restraint to be provided to the compression flange. So, that does not rotate. So, though the member is supported far away like this. In fact, double in this case, the member will not go into torsional buckling because I have got the compression flange restrained from rotation by having sufficient uh, stiffness perpendicular to the member. Similarly here, though it is a cantilever, no support is there. This is probably a tiny member, just for picture I have put the same member, but you can have a small member which is preventing the beam from rotation. So, you can get this better capacity. 
the beams can be fabricated or obtained from mills. So, you can see on the left one is basically a rolled beam means there is no welding involved. That means, you will take a large size piece of steel and roll it to get this shape which, which is called a rolled beam. Uh, but one of the problem is larger sizes are not available readily because nobody will make this kind of beams and keep it ready. So, in that cases we can take plates and then fabricate. I think I told you about in the in the previous sessions uh, fillet weld and penetration weld I think hope you, you remember. So, you can see in the middle one is basically a, a fillet welded the right side one is the penetration welded which will give you a better uh, connection between the flange and. So, you can see the notations which I am following is slightly different from the course. So, you have to be little bit careful when you are referring to the course. So, width of the flange height of the web is given uh, in a notation this way the total height is noted as uh, h thickness of the flange and thickness of the web. So, I am going to concentrate focus only on this kind of uh, uh, I sections in this next two classes. So, the rolled beam is nothing but there is no welding involved, but I you can see here slightly curved because during the rolling process you do not want to get or you may not be able to get the, the 90 degree angle there. So, you just allow you to have such a radius fillet radius whereas, in case of uh, welded beams like fillet welded beams you will get this kind of shape and the uh, penetration welded is not going to be exactly like this, but you will get some kind of profile. Now, what we need to look at is one special characteristics for these flanged beams is the flange and web bar free edges, whereas if you take a circular section there is no free edge it is completely connected and it is not going to become wobbly. So, in this case you got a flange you got a web of course, web is connected to two flanges, but then the flange itself is not supported anywhere unless you go and support it on the sides. So, that is why we need to see whether the behavior of this I beam is going to be achieved maximum uh, allowable stress. For example, you take this flange instead of making the flange 200 mm you make it 2 meter. So, what will happen you know the flange will sag in this plane which is not good. So, there is a limit by which for a given thickness for a given thickness of say 10 mm how much could be the width of the flange. So, that is why we call it a compactness of the flange or compactness of plated structures against local buckling and that is why we need to follow certain procedure. In this case since we are following a American code the American codes are giving certain limitations on the width to thickness ratio of the the uh, flat plate structures. So, flange web you can see uh, uh, the formula is empirical. So, as long as you keep the uh, this is basically a compression element, but for let us look at the, the flexure element basically a beam we will see compact non compact and slender. So, as long as you keep the uh, sections within these limits for example, for compact sections you need to keep the the thickness and the width to thickness ratio less than approximately 9 to 10 irrespective of 36 ksi material or 50 ksi material you see here around 10. So, if the flange width is 20 times your thickness you are you are there, but if you make it 20 times 30 times it is not very good you know because the thickness is too small the flange will be quite wobbly and bend. So, that is the idea behind. So, as long as you keep it less than around 10 then you can call it compact section and go beyond you have a non compact and go beyond it becomes too slender. So, the flange is classified as compact non compact and uh, slender. Similarly, the web can be classified as long as 1 in 90 1 in 100. So, 1 meter 1 meter deep girder you need at least minimum 12 mm 15 mm thickness. If you keep it less than that the, the web is going to be slender and fail by local buckling. So, that is the idea you can see here compact non compact or cylinder webs starting from 90 and beyond. So, 1 meter means minimum at least 12 mm. So, when you are designing a gutter you can easily you do not need to do calculations first of all look at this because you do not want to make any of the beam or a column to fail by local buckling because local buckling means is very certain that it will fail. 
So, you want to avoid that you keep it below this 90. So, that is good. Similarly, this is this is basically members in flexure, members in bending, members in axial load. Here we have two cases, there is no compact case, it is either cylinder case or non cylinder case. So, this is specifically for columns. So, you can see here uh, you know the thickness to uh, width to thickness ratio is around 15 for non cylinder and beyond is going to be cylinder. Similarly, for web is about 35 to 40 and beyond is going to be cylinder. So, when you are proposing a column or a beam or when you are selecting a column or a beam from a rolled shape, you look at the thickness, you look at the size. Fortunately, if you select a beam from American uh, code catalog, most of them are compact. So, you do not need to worry. The problem will come when you try to make your own column on your own beam by cutting the plates and welding to form and that is the time you will get into trouble if you do not propose it properly. And also we discussed about last time uh, the elastic and plastic properties of tubular sections. I think we spent uh, substantial time. So, when it comes to I section we could also derive similar uh, properties which is I think uh, basic mechanics in your secondary engineering. So, you should recollect uh, the linear stress distribution then the plastic stress distribution on the right hand side you can see here is a rectangular uh, pattern whereas, this is a triangular pattern. And, uh, I have given in the next two slides for a symmetric section I have derived the elastic and plastic modulus, uh, but for the uh, uh, the unsymmetric section I have just put forward the, uh, the elastic properties of the uh, unsymmetric section. You can also derive similarly the plastic section property slightly complicated uh, which I could not uh, get it. So, you can actually derive it and use it for the design. So, in here you can see here the notation you have to carefully remember S x, S y I have given as elastic and z x and z y given as plastic properties. So, basically uh, based on the uh, stress distribution what we have put forward for the elastic and plastic sections. So, the next class we will look at uh, what we are going to see is the code provisions for the AAC for uh, various um, forces of action on the beam, axial tension and compression bending and the shear and the combinations. We will just quickly see the tension basic idea is how the code is written. The previous version of the American code for uh, steel design is based on allowable stress method which is called a ninth edition just for your information and then substantial time was uh, left between the ninth edition to the next revision because a lot of research activities were going on since 1989. So, you see since 1989 to now is about almost 20, 22 years a lot of research activities was going on to incorporate that they took a lot of time. Then suddenly they introduced the edition called the 13th edition from 9th edition to a 13th edition. The logic of that edition I do not know, but what has happened is from 9th edition they have changed to 13th edition incorporating the allowable stress design as well as the LRFD method. Hope all of you remember the LRFD the difference between the ASD and LRFD and introduce. So, this 13th edition had provisions for uh, both you can choose to design by ASD or you can choose to design by LRFD and a year later they have also revised the code because there were several uh, anomalies. So, now it is basically 14th edition. So, remember 14th edition is the latest AAC code which has got provisions for uh, both methods of design. So, I have just put forward both so that in case if you have to design by LRFD methods, I have given all the uh, uh, formulas and information so that you can choose to do either way. But one good thing is instead of writing two codes, the formulation is such that the most of the mechanics and the equations are same except the substitution of parameters either you have a load factor for LRFD, but for ASD there is no load factor. For ASD you will have allowable stress factor and for uh, uh, LRFD you will have a material factor. So, the factors are given as a table. So, you, you just follow the same design procedure only substitute wherever you require. For example, you see here design tensile strength is defined as phi t multiplied by p n 
allowable tensile strength is basically a p nominal divided by a stress factor and p nominal is defined as so this is not going to change yield strength multiplied by the cross sectional area will give you the yield force and yield force divided by factor of safety factor will give you the allowable axial load whereas multiply by a material factor or strength factor is giving you the design tensile strength for lrfd so you just achieve everything in one go so you, you as long as you can calculate this you can calculate the allowable force for allowable stress design and design force for lrfd design so that's the idea behind so you see here on the table i have just given you the numbers and the unity check can be defined here for example unity check for allowable stress design is applied force which is p divided by allowable axial force which i think is very similar to what we were doing for tubular and for lrfd unity check basically you will multiply by a load factor which is gamma times p divided by p design force which is basically pd i think you, with this slide you can you can easily see what difference we are trying to do when you are talking about asd versus lrfd and when you want to just dig back inside see for example if you take these factors you go back here you will find both methods will produce exactly same result if you spend 2 minutes on trying to find out for example this tau t is 1.67 anyway rupture i am not talking about because most of the cases we don't have rupture rupture will come only when you have a bolted connections whereas we are having welded connections so if you take 1.67 you go here you actually substitute here 0.67 f y will come as allowable stress that's what we were looking at in api similarly you go here you take phi t which is basically 0.9 and if you take 1.5 you will ultimately get a similar the load factor is 1.5 and you go here and when you substitute it here you will find again 0.67 f y only so there is absolutely no difference as long as you use a load factor 1.5 but if you use a load factor 1.3 then there will be a slight different and that's the advantage of lrfd that it allows you to use a different load factors for different scenarios dead load live load variable load environmental load so there is potentially a optimal design can come from lrfd rather than a single factor safety from i think we spoke about it sufficient enough during the early classes i think we can see tomorrow